Outrocast. Hey, Jim, how's it going there? Very good. And you, where are you? I am in New York. Are you in Los Angeles? I am, yeah. Somebody's got to be. What Around what year did you move from New York to Los Angeles? 1985. 1985. And anybody who reads your new book, Caught With My Pants Down and Other Tales from Life in Hollywood, would know that, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So how long did it take you to write a memoir? Because it's not like you've just had a two-year career. Yeah, no. Um, it, it took... It, it, I started it shortly before the lockdown two years ago. Um, and then it, what would have probably taken five years took about five months from then on. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a perfect time to sort of stop, get off the merry-go-round and look back as opposed to I'm always looking forward and right in front of me. <clears throat> so it was really great to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people have that fear that, they not only have to look back and they don't want to look back, but also the, wait, I'm looking at my career in periphery if I'm doing that kind of a project. So no hesitation from you for doing that? Yeah, it was kind of like pulling teeth compared to writing screenplays or teleplays uh, because you, you kind of, um, first of all, you have to kind of remember exactly how it happened and what happened. And, and then you kind of go, well, I'll fill in the gaps and then consult old schedule books to check you know, what, what actually happened when and whether you've got something completely out of sequence. Not that it particularly matters. Um, but for me, the, the real criteria, what it boiled down to was kind of get it all out there and then um, anything that wasn't a good anecdote or a good story didn't make it. You know, I mean, there's, there's 38 chapters uh, and if there wasn't a good story within each of those chapters, which aren't particularly long, um, some are longer than others, um, it, it was gone. It was gone because I didn't want to write just the Jim Puddock life story because I'm not interested in it. So I don't know why anyone else would be. But but I think my encounters and what I've kind of navigated is is of of interest to people. So it's as much about the observed as the observer. You mentioned something in there about having the old books, the old records. Did you have all that or is there a deep digging process to that? Yeah, no, I keep these um, these sort of weekly schedule books uh, I've, kept, I've kept them since when I moved to this country in 1981 so I can go back and find out when I had a meeting with so-and-so or Dubois or whatever if I need to um, it's you know there's piles and piles of them in the one of the closets behind me um, it's quite useful to have that but it's also disconcerting when you go through some of them and you go I've no idea who that is I don't know who that is I had several meetings with them over a period of time and I can't remember who they were. You know, that's that's a bit worrying. You never thought to go digital calendar, iCal or Google Calendar? Well, I do that to a degree now, but um, but I still know I still like to have this physical thing written down. I don't know why. It just goes with me everywhere. Hmm. So a lot of authors that I interview about a memoir that they've done, uh, you know, sometimes the book that they set out to write was not the end result. In your case, did you know... Uh, was it a case of, well, it's going to be an anecdote book? Did it start off in a different way? It did. I mean, I knew roughly because I'd done this evening at the Screen Actors Guild. They'd asked me to come in for something called Inside the Industry. Let's talk about whatever. And then uh, <clears throat> so I was interviewed by a Wall Street Journal entertainment reporter called Eric Schwartzel. And we talked for about maybe just under an hour and then had a Q&A. Mm -hmm. And I didn't prepare anything. Um, I just thought I'm going going to sort of tell some stories and see, uh, you know, that demonstrate in my interactions and how show business works. And um, it, it, it was very well received and I really enjoyed doing it. So I came away thinking, um, I, I might, I haven't done theatre for a long while. Why don't I think about doing this as a one man show and sure. just go around? And, and I started writing it and, and soon became obvious it was going to be about a 10 hour show. So I kind of thought that's going to test the, patience of any theatre audience. Um, so then I started thinking about the book um, and then started writing it. But I, I knew that it would be structured loosely around the narrative uh, and the linear narrative of my life um, in show business and, and outside, actually. Uh, but beyond that, it was, again, it was always a question of what, what is it about? I mean, that's what you find as you write. I didn't know what it was about. And then I found the themes that came, emerged as I wrote, were uh, 
about my search for family, mm -hmm. which has been um, uh, a constant throughout. And, and so when I knew that, I could go back and then accentuate that more and tie that into all the stories and everything. So the search for family, the importance of every choice you make of every day, Mm -hmm. literally any single thing. I don't think you can overstate how important every single choice is that you make on every day because that defines who you are and what your life becomes and your entire destiny. And I really do believe that. And, and then I suppose the third thing that sort of emerged was um, the importance of, of living life to the fullest, which is not an original thought. And I'm not the first person to express that uh but it no, really but became... how you come to that is always an original journey exactly it was very interesting to that, that that became you know and that was actually quite pleasing because i did feel even though there are times in your life where you, you feel i'm treading water here or i'm not really doing anything and and this is just now i'm in a rut i i kind of have to say that on balance a good majority of the time i didn't and i i kind of took risks and i i went for things with knowing I could easily fall flat on my face and yeah. often did. And, and, and that's part of the fun of the book. I mean, some of the stuff that I like the most are the things that go wrong. I mean, that's always funny to me. Uh, and the embarrassing things and the, the, the cringe of, of the, of those stories that, that are often self deprecatory. And um, uh, if that's the right word, deprecatory, I don't know how you say it. I can write it. Um, and then, uh, and, and other, other people too. I mean, that, I, I mean, I will say one thing. The book is absolutely honest. I am brutally honest about myself and brutally honest about other people. And so I think that does distinguish it. A number of people have had been lucky to have about three dozen celebrities kind of review it and, and have all said lovely yeah. things. But the, the constant... That and endorsements that you have pretty high echelon it's yeah that, it's pretty that surprised the hell out of me but but i think the one constant was it's so refreshing because you name names and most memoirs don't showbiz ones particularly yeah uh, that's a good point right and there. i really do there's three people i eviscerate completely one i'm semi eviscerate uh, and the three that i eviscerate completely one is dead so they can't sue me um and the two others are still very much alive and working and very well known and i don't care i don't care i think bad behavior whether it be in show business or any other walk of life i'm old enough now to go i'm going to call it out and i do it in person if someone behaves badly on a set i call them out on it not in an unpleasant way just you know it's not it's not acceptable and i, and I can get away with it because i am in my 60s and sort of a senior citizen <laughs> Um, and, and I wouldn't I've, call you a senior citizen. I got to interrupt you there. When you look at uh, the fact that Norman Lear is still writing television. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but technically, I'm a senior citizen by English standards. Yeah, you're pensionable. <laughs> but I think I it's wonderful with your story that you were able to transition from theater actor to film and television actor to actor slash writer that's actually getting stuff made. Yeah, I think we're now used to seeing pretty much everyone is an actor slash comic slash producer that Judd Apatow school of, well, he's going to star in this one and then he's going to produce this one and co-write this one and have yeah. seven plates in there. But you were doing that before that was the normal business model. Oh, I was ahead of the curve. <laughs> I, was, oh. I was so ahead of the curve. Um, it was out of necessity, really. I, I got bored. I get bored very easily. So once I stopped doing theater full time, uh, whereas, you know, I mean, in New York, I was I was basically doing eight shows a week for three years. I mean, yeah. uh, it was yeah, amazing. It was a great run on Broadway. And then I kind of got a bit burnt out. And so I moved to L.A. to try and do more film and TV or to do some TV and film because I'd done none. Right. And um, I obviously had more time on my hands. So I, you know, get the odd job here, there. I'd be working one week out of every six, one week every two months. I don't know. And then I... I was going nuts. So just to keep myself sane, I'd always wanted to write. I started writing and I learned the craft of screenwriting and um, I got lucky, you know, I mean, obviously I, I have a degree in English, so I, I knew I had a certain ability to write and understand English. Uh, <laughs> just, a and, just a bit. And, um, <laughs> and luckily my first screenplay uh, sold for, for a fairly large sum of money and I became, uh, I was in that game suddenly and I had a whole new career. As well, yeah. you know, a parallel career. Well, going through that list of successes, uh, 
It does include the movie The Tooth Fairy. And I'd, I I hope you don't mind me bringing that up that you wrote the story to that because it did get a sequel. So yeah. I'm curious when that went from in your life and your estimation, when it went from being a Ugh, to a wait a second, that starred the biggest movie star in the world. Yeah. And generations of people are going to be watching this. Yeah. I'm going to tell people I did this one. Um, I was, I w- I'll tell you a story behind that. I, I came up with the idea for that well, over dinner with my nine, she was nine years old at the time, my daughter, she's now 27. And um, we, I said, I want to write a movie about Christmas, Santa Claus. And then we sort of talked a bit and I realized they've all been done. I couldn't yeah. think of anything original. So I said, what about the tooth fairy? And she went, oh my God, it's great. It's great. I've never, we've never seen that, you know? And, and she, we talked a little bit. And then the next day I wrote down some notes and I had a general meeting that week with Jason Blum, who's gone on to become the biggest Blumhouse. producer. Of, I know, yeah, Blumhouse, yeah, yeah, biggest okay. producer of horror movies in the world. Yeah. And Jason was doing all sorts of things then. He had just left Miramax as an executive and he loved it too. And so he said, well, write this up as a big full story, a treatment for a movie. Um, so I wrote, I went away and wrote that. And But as I was doing it, I, I suddenly realized I'd already written family comedies. And I wanted to write a drama next, and I had something very much in mind. And I also thought, this is a really mainstream movie idea. And I'm always a bit off that. I'm a bit indie in terms of my sensibility. And so I said to Jason, I- I'm happy to write this story and produce the movie with you, but I think we should find someone else to write it, the actual screenplay. And we ended up with Lau Gantz and Babalu Mandel, who are obviously... Oh, yeah. The Coming great from America. And oh, everything. yeah, Parenthood. The great deans. Uh, I mean, League of Their Own. So many movies. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, City Slickers, everything. And and they were great. And they very much saw the movie as I did. So and it was lovely for me. I didn't have to do the heavy lifting. They would, <laughs> in, the, in the studio meetings, instead of my sphincter tightening every time an executive gave me a note that I thought was either really stupid or incomprehensible. Uh, and by the way, they're not all like that. Some of them are very good. Right. But, I would I would get defensive or I'd just go, oh, my God, how am I going to do that? And I would get really stressed out. Uh, but this case, I would just smile through the whole meeting, go, absolutely, yep, yep, no, 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 very good, yeah. a really good note, and then turn to the guys and go, yeah, yeah, does that make sense, guys? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. and, and and just pass the buck completely. It was totally shameless. And, but then I, I have to admit, I did actually help them because I had written screenplays and was a writer. I was able to sort of get us out of a few problem corners here and there in the writing process. And I was able to kind of be a bit of a, a, a kind of a third eye or a, a seventh and eighth eye, actually, if there's a, well, yeah, my <laughs> math is terrible. Fifth and sixth eye, there's two of them. Yeah. Uh, although I have one eye, I only have one eye. So it's actually just a fifth eye. Um, yeah. So uh, that was kind of interesting. And then I, I, I was loosely involved. I only went up to the set for a couple of days because I was working on something else by the time it got made. And um, I, I hadn't met uh, Dwayne and I went on the set and um, someone, I, I walked on the set and someone said, um, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm Jim Piddick. He said, what do you do on the show? And I said, well, it's, it's a movie, not a show. And, and, um, and then I said, I'm an executive producer. And they said, what does that mean? And I said, well, it means different things on different movies. On this yeah. particular movie, my job is this. And they said, what's that? And I said, I come onto the set and when someone asks me what I do, I tell them that I'm the executive producer <laughs> and that's it. There's no, nothing else at this point. Uh, anyway, I went on and then, and then uh, Dwayne called everyone, stopped the shooting and said, everyone come in, come in, cast, crew, everybody. I'd like to introduce Jim Piddock, who is the man responsible for us all being here. And it was so classy. I mean, no one has ever uh, in my experience, done that for a writer. No one ever, they just go, oh, you're the writer. Okay, thank you. Um, and yeah. you're, still, you're still here. How amazing. Um, so it was way and above the call of duty. And, and I, I have so much respect for that. It was such a classy thing to do. And he was delightful in the film. And it was exactly as I'd envisioned the poster, you know, the man with wings or in a tutu, uh, a big, you know, butch guy, whether it be Vince Vaughn, the, the Rock, or, you know, any of those people. And he was wonderful, charming. And, and I went to the, the premiere and I was talking with Stephen Merchant afterwards, who's also wonderful in it. You know, I mean, there's Julie oh, yeah. Andrews, there's Billy Crystal, there's, there's, uh, oh, there's all sorts of people in it. And it's, it's, um, it's really, 
he came out and said, boy, you'd have to be really hard hearted not to like this movie. It's very sweet. It's an old throwback. It's like an old Disney movie, even though it was made by 20th Century Fox. And, and I think he was right. He, it's, it's got a charm and a sweetness and has been seen by kids and parents all over the world. I mean, it was a film that made well, well, well over 100 million. I think it made like 130 million just at the box office. So God right. knows what it made with ancillary yeah, stuff. Education and yeah. Exactly. And, and it was, I was never, like people say, you know, you've done such high end class. And I, Yes, but that's why I didn't want to roll up my sleeves and write it. That's not, you know, what wasn't my entirely my sensibility. So I'm, I'm actually proud of the fact that it reached that many people and has been enjoyed by that many people. And it didn't suck. I mean, listen, is it an Academy Award winner? No. Was it ever intended to be? No. So I, I, I feel very pleased and proud that I wrote a very commercial, very pleasant nice movie that kids have grown up with and, and and love i could not have asked for a better answer the quick follow-up to that before i ask you the last question is did you graduate to the level with dwayne johnson where you called him dj <laughs> no I, I really just was around him for those two days dj uh, no um but you know I, I i i'm a big fan of his i think he's a, he's one of the good guys for sure. And the last question I have is, what are you allowed to say that you're working on in the moment besides promoting this memoir? And the reason I ask that is because, of course, there's embargoes of Deadline.com and Hollywood Reporter, and you can't talk about this until that person announces it, et cetera. But as a prolific guy who has multiple jobs, I yeah. know you're working on stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hate all that non-disclosure agreement thing. And yeah. when they send them to me, I just go, God, the arrogance, who cares? You know, really? And by the way, there comes a time when you're going to be begging me to promote this damn thing. So what? <laughs> you have to be the first to, do, oh, shut up. You know, um, yeah, yeah. so I can tell you what I'm working about because I don't think it's any secret. Uh, I finished shooting a film in November called uh, The Queen Mary, uh, which is shot in London. Um, and it's, I play the captain of the Queen Mary, Captain Carradine in the 1930s. And it's a supernatural uh, thriller. It's a, it's a, I, I, I hesitate to call it a horror movie because it's, it isn't really, it's a, it's a supernatural thriller, but I, but I do get to, to, to do a lot of violent things in it. Um, it, it so that's, will be coming out, I'm assuming late this year or early next year. I mean, I know they're in post-production. Mm -hmm. I have a film that's supposed to start shooting in the next two to three months in England called Frankel, starring Jeremy Irons and I think Minnie Driver, um, which is about famous racehorse called Frankel, which is still to this day the highest rated racehorse in English history and um, uh, was trained by Sir Henry Cecil, uh, who, who was an eccentric man who had had an amazing career as a trainer, was number one trainer in the world, and his life had fallen apart, absolutely fallen apart, personally, in every single way, and was given his twin brother identical twin had died of cancer and he was given six months to live himself and his studio was his studio his stable was in ruins and um all his owners had taken their horses and this one owner uh khalid sheikh khalid Abdullah, gave him a horse and said this i think you can train this horse and it turned out to be henry's greatest triumph it was a, it's the most amazing sports story but Bigger than that, it's an incredible second chance and redemption story. And it completely brought his life together again. He, kept, he stayed alive for another five years, saw out the entire career of the horse, and the horse remained unbeaten and retired and is now worth hundreds of millions as a stud horse. And, and it was his greatest triumph. And he died, I think, just a few months after the horse was retired. But it's a, it's a lovely redemption story and a second chance and a man who pulled his life together as he was dying. It's an extraordinary story. And so that, that I'm looking forward to being made and I'll play a small part in that. I'll probably play uh, uh, the doctor who gives him the bad news. Uh, sorry, you've got a few well, months to go. Speaking of extraordinary stories, I mean, your memoir, I think if you're a student of the entertainment world, it's an inspirational tale to see how much you overcame creatively, personally, how you took chances. I think a lot of people in your position just would have stayed in England and that's that. But Thank you. 
you you made it and it's great to see that these decades later you're still churning out great art so i really appreciate your time jim and look forward to whatever's next thank you so much Outro cast. <laughs>